If you want to be able to retire wealthier, be financially free, you need passive income because with passive income, you can get paid without having to go to work. Now, most people assume that if you want to start generating passive income, you need a lot of money. Like you need a million dollars to go out and start generating passive income, but that's not true. You don't need a lot of money to start generating passive income. And so today, I'm going to be going over how you can start generating passive income so you can retire wealthy. So let's jump right into it. Like most people, I didn't grow up learning about financial education or investing or passive passive income. The first time I really heard about this idea of passive income was when I read the book Rich Dad Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. And when I read that book, I got really excited because I could not believe that you could do something where now you purchase something, you do something, and now this thing is going to continue to pay you without you physically having to work. I grew up in a traditional Indian household and in my household, the idea of passive income is you work really hard in school, that way you can become a doctor and now once you're a doctor, you can get passive income because now, well, you go and you do a surgery and you're gonna make a lot of money and it's passive because hopefully you'll be a good doctor. And if you're not a good doctor, well, I guess it's a good thing I didn't become a doctor. This whole concept of using your money or your time in a certain way where you can build this asset that will continue to pay you for years into the future was unheard of. And that's when I started learning about money and started learning about what passive income was. And that's why in this video, I wanna go over some of the different passive income strategies that there are out there. That way you can start using these strategies to start generating more passive income for you. So the first kind of passive income that I was ever really exposed to was something called dividend income. Dividends are a way that stocks can pay you for just owning a stock. If you go onto the stock market right now and you purchase one share of the McDonald's Corporation, you become one of the owners of McDonald's. Now, you don't gotta go and start flipping burgers or doing anything like that, but you do get to share in the profits when McDonald's makes money. And there's a couple of different ways that you can make money. First is through appreciation. If the McDonald's company opens a whole bunch of new franchises and they start making more money, more people are gonna be interested in investing in the McDonald's stock and that's gonna push the stock price higher. That's appreciation. So if I buy my stock at $100 a share and I sell it for $200 a share, well, that's $100 in appreciation. And if I sell my stock at $200, I just made a $100 profit because I bought it at 100 and I sold it at 200. Now, the downfall with this type of appreciation is one, it's not guaranteed because there's a chance that you buy a stock at $100 a share and then it's gonna go down to $50 a share and now you just lost money if you sold it. And the second thing is you don't actually make money until you sell. And if you sell the stock, you don't own this asset anymore. If you buy a stock at $100 a share and it goes up to $200 a share and now you sell it, well now you no longer own this asset and this asset is gone and you made a little bit of money. But now you might be questioning, hey, what if the stock goes up to $300 or $400 or $1,000? And you never know that because we cannot predict the future. And if you sell your stock, well now you lose out on all the potential upside, although you did cash in on the $100 of profit. But now if the stock goes higher, you don't get any of that upside. Dividends work a little bit differently because the way the dividends work, now a company is gonna pay you with cash just for owning the stock and you don't gotta sell any of your stock to make this money. So going back to the McDonald's example, McDonald's makes a lot of money and at the end of the year, they have a lot of cash profit sitting in their bank account. Now there's a few different things that they can do with this cash. They can save this money for an emergency, they can invest their money in future growth, or they can pay this money back to the shareholders, their investors, people like you through a dividend. A good and mature company is gonna do all three because every good mature company is gonna to wanna to have some savings to protect them from any sort of emergency that might happen in the world and a good company is gonna to wanna to be investing in their future so they might be investing in creating new stores and creating new food options, creating new things to keep customers coming back and a good company is gonna to wanna to reward their investors who have stuck by this company because these investors are the people that believe in the company. So if a company has a lot of profit and now they wanna give some of this money back to shareholders through dividends. Now, if you are an owner of a company, then this company is gonna pay you dividends, usually every three months or every quarter, and this is money that you get without you having to sell your stock. So if McDonald's has a big profit at the end of the year and they issue a dividend, well now, you're gonna be getting these cash checks and you don't gotta sell your stock to do that, and this is completely passive. In general, there are two different ways that you can start generating this dividend income through stocks in the stock market. One is through actual stocks, and the other is through ETFs. So an ETF is an exchange traded fund. You could think of this kind of like a basket of stocks. That way now, you don't have to worry about trying to find the perfect company or the perfect stock. Because if you don't know how to research stocks and you find the wrong stock, well now your stock can go to zero and now you just lost all of your investment. The way to kind of go around that is to invest your money into an ETF, which is a whole group of stocks. That way even if one company in your ETF goes bankrupt, 
you're okay because you might have 100 other companies which are keeping the ETF up. So a few examples of stocks that pay out dividends. And again, this is not investment advice. This is just an example because you are never guaranteed to make money when you invest. You might even lose money. So make sure you always do your own due diligence and never blindly listen to a random guy on YouTube. So a few examples of stocks that pay out dividends would be IBM, McDonald's, and uh, Gilead, G-I-L-D. Right now at the time we're recording this video, IBM pays out around 4.5% a year in dividends, McDonald's at around 2.2% a year in dividends, and Gilead right around 4% a year in dividends. So if you invested $100 into any one of these, you would get about $4.5 a year through IBM, $2.20 through McDonald's, and then about $4 here through Gilead. Now, again, this is just the dividends. You're also hoping that you're investing your money into a strong company that you believe is gonna be worth more in the future, but this is consistent dividend income that you are getting passively. On the ETF side, a couple dividend ETFs are VIG, which is the Vanguard ETF, and then S. D Y. At the time we were recording this video, this pays out right around one and a half percent a year in dividends, and SDY is paying around around two and a half percent a year in dividends. Again, this is just the dividend, and when you invest in these ETFs, now you're getting exposure to a whole bunch of high dividend paying companies. So now, even if one company goes under, you're okay because the ETF is invested in many different companies. The nice thing about this type of passive income is it doesn't require a whole bunch of time on your end. Once you find a good company that you want to invest in, you put your money into it, now you let the company do all the work. Once you invest in any of these companies or these ETFs, now the people that are working at these companies are going to be working every single day to make a profit for the company, and the bigger profit they make, the more money you make, and now all you have to do is just make sure that your company is not about to go under. So that's when I started investing in dividends, and I started going onto Google, searching high dividend paying companies, and that's when I came across this thing called REITs, R-E-I-T. A REIT is a real estate investment trust, and a real estate investment trust is a company that invests in real estate. So a REIT is a way for you to invest your money and get exposure to real estate without having to physically invest in real estate. The advantage with REITs is many REITs pay a higher dividends because REITs have to follow something called the 90% rule, which says that this company, the company that invests in real estate, has to pay out 90% of all their taxable income or their profits to shareholders, people like you, through dividends. So REITs make their money through dividends, and now they're required to pay out 90% of their profits, their taxable income, to people like you through dividends, which means many REITs pay out higher dividends. This got me kind of excited because now I'm this young college kid, and I'm learning about REITs and dividends, and I'm like, whoa, some of these REITs are paying out huge, massive dividends, even 10% or more a year. And so I started putting my money in REITs. And what I learned is when the dividends are paid out, many times the stock price is going to fall by the amount of the dividend. Like if a stock is paying out a $3 dividend in this quarter, then you might see the stock price fall by $3. This is where I wanna give you a little bit of caution as an investor who's looking for this passive income, especially through dividends, because when you're making your investment decisions in the stock market, you don't wanna make an investment decision based solely off of the dividend returns, because sometimes the dividend return can be misleading. If you go online right now and you see a stock trading at $100 a share, and you see that it's paying out a dividend, an annual dividend of let's just say $10 a year, that means this company is paying out a 10% annual dividend. At first glance, that's gonna look great because now you're getting a 10% return on your money if you buy the stock at $100 a share. But this doesn't tell you the full picture because what if three months ago, the stock was trading at $1,000 a share. And over the last few months, the stock has lost 90% of its value, which is why this dividend amount looks so big compared to this price. Because sometimes what happens is companies start to go under and then they cut their dividends a little bit later. So this company might still be issuing this dividend right now, but might be on the verge of getting rid of their dividend. So at first glance, this looks great. You're getting a 10% return on your money. And then you invest your money into this company. And then two months later, you find out that they're cutting their dividend. So now you're not actually making this money. And then you find out that your company is on the verge of bankruptcy. So now the stock is worth zero dollars. Now REITs can be a great way for you to start generating passive income. But again, it goes back to the research that you're doing. If you believe in the REIT and you believe in what type of investment properties this company is investing in, then by all means, go and invest in it because you believe in the company, but don't make your investment decisions based solely on the dividend that they're paying out. Look beyond just that dividend percentage and look at the company in addition to the type of dividends that they're paying. This brings me to the 
the next type of passive income, which is one of my favorite types of passive income, which is through rental properties. The way this works is let's say I find this house on sale for $150,000 and now I buy this home. But now instead of me buying this home for me to live in myself, I'm gonna buy this home to use as a rental property, as an investment. So buy this home for $150,000 and now instead of me living there, I'm gonna rent this property out to somebody else. So I find this very nice couple, this man who has a mustache and this female who has a braid or as we like to call it in my native language, Punjabi, a gut. So I'm gonna rent this home out to this couple right here and in exchange for them living in my property, they're gonna pay me $1,500 a month every single month for living on my property. Now the great thing about this is once you buy this home once, you're done. You own the asset, you own the property, and now these people are gonna have to pay you every single month for living in your property. So once you buy this asset, it is now a cash flowing asset and it's gonna pay you forever as long as you own the property or until the property gets burned down. Now, the great thing about this is one, you're getting cash flow and second, you're getting tax breaks because real estate has a bunch of tax loopholes which allow investors to make money and pay less money in taxes legally. Now, this is where things get a little bit tricky because anytime you read a book about real estate investing or if you go watch videos about real estate investing, they make it look and sound so easy and so simple. All you gotta do is find this property for $150,000, then you find this tenant that's gonna pay you $1,500 a month, and then you're done. Your tenant's paying for your mortgage, they're paying for your bills, and they're putting some money in your pocket. But it's not always that easy. Okay, when I got started in real estate investing, I thought it was gonna be passive, but it was anything but passive because I didn't understand how the process worked. I was getting calls from my tenant every single day, even though I had a property management company, I didn't know how to find the right contractor, I didn't know how to find the right people to work with. And so the thing that you have to understand about real estate investing is it can be passive, but in order for it to become passive, you have to go through this big kind of learning curve, this big hurdle, which takes a lot of time on your end. You're gonna have to learn how to find property managers because a property manager's job is to make this completely passive for you. Their job is to work with the tenants, so you don't gotta know who the tenants are, and the tenants don't gotta know who you are, so anytime the toilet breaks down and the tenants need work, they're gonna call the property management company, who's gonna take care of all the work, and your property management company is gonna take care of all the bills paying, they're gonna make sure your tenants are paying, and they're gonna make sure that your property's in good shape. So your property management company is the person that's gonna make this passive for you, but in addition to that, you gotta know how to find the right property management company, you have to know how to find a good real estate agent, you have to know how to work with contractors, you have to know how to work with the city and the city hall, and property and building inspectors. And then you gotta learn how to work with attorneys and accountants and a whole bunch of other people. But once you get past that hurdle, then real estate can be a great way for you to start generating passive income through cash flow. Now, one of the reasons why I don't like to call it passive income is because if you wanna keep generating more income, you wanna still be involved with the real estate investment properties. Like you wanna keep looking for more properties and you wanna make sure that this area that you're investing in is growing and more people are wanting to live there and that there's more demand coming into this area. But in the sense of this property generating you cash flow, yeah, that can be completely passive once you get past that initial hurdle. The downfall with investing in real estate is it takes a lot of capital to get started. Like even if we're talking about basic entry level single family homes, and this isn't across the United States, because if you're going to New York or California, you're not gonna get a home for $150,000, but in some places you will. But even in these basic entry level homes, you need a lot of cash to get started. If you don't have $150,000, you gotta raise some debt. If you can't do that, then you gotta get money from your friends and family. And if you can't do that, well now you can't buy real estate because you don't have the cash to afford real estate. But that doesn't mean that you cannot get exposure to real estate, like what we talked about earlier. REITs are a way for you to get exposure to real estate because when you invest in a REIT, you're investing in a company which invests in real estate. So you're not getting that direct exposure to real estate, but you're investing in a company that you believe is investing in the right properties. Another way that you can get exposure to real estate and start generating some passive income is through something called crowdfunded real estate. The way that crowdfunded real estate works is now you're gonna invest your money into a fund that gets exposure to an apartment complex or to a portfolio of complexes. Now, you don't have to put up the full money to buy a full property, but you you can put in some money, whether it's a few hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars, and now you get a little piece of exposure to a larger portfolio of properties. The nice thing about investing in this type of crowdfunded real estate is you don't need a ton of cash to start investing in real estate, and you don't gotta worry about
about dealing with tenants or dealing with all that headache like I talked about just a minute ago because now all you're doing is putting up the cash and you're letting the developers and the investors deal with all that headache. Plus now you'll get your share of appreciation and you'll get your share of cash flow or passive income through dividends when this property generates cash flow. The downfall with crowdfunded real estate is well, you don't actually own the physical property. You're just getting exposure to a piece of it because you're not putting up the money to buy the entire property. So you got your pros and cons. This brings me to ways that you can start generating cash flow a little bit quicker because when you're investing just your money, like if you're investing for dividends or just rental income, then what you're doing is you're just investing your money and now you're gonna get a smaller return on your money because now it's just your money working. But if you invest your time and your money, now you can get a bigger return because now you're physically working to grow your money and to generate that bigger income. This is where you have to kind of define the right level of passive for you and what is passive. Because when I was first learning about this passive income idea and theory, I was running my own event planning company. And the way the company worked is we used to host a whole bunch of different type of college events. We used to host college parties and college concerts and things like that. And the issue with this is there was really no way for me to generate any sort of passive income because I would have to host an event and if I didn't host an event, I wouldn't get paid. But when I hosted an event, I would make decent money. And so for me to host this event, I'd have to put in a whole bunch of work into marketing and preparation and finding the right artists. And then when people would come, they would pay me. But if I didn't host an event, I wasn't getting paid. So the only way I was getting paid is if I was physically working and hosting an event. So I really had no way to generate some sort of passive income. That's when I started telling myself that I need to build a business which has the possibility or the ability to make money without me physically having to do something. Because before, if I wasn't planning and hosting an event, I was not gonna get paid. But I was trying to figure out if there was a way for me to create something or build something that would continue to pay me without me having to physically host an event. That's when I ended up creating an online sock company. And the way that this online sock company was, was I had a store on Shopify, I built a store on Shopify, and then I had an inventory of products. And then somebody can go onto our store whenever they wanted, any hour of the day, and it doesn't matter what part of the world that you were in. And if you purchased a pair of socks, but now I just generated a little bit of revenue and it didn't matter if I was sleeping when you placed that order or if I was out on the beach when you placed the order. Although when I was running this company, I was definitely not ever on the beach. But this is where things started to click a little bit more in terms of scalability. Because if you want to build any sort of scalable product, whether it's a side hustle or a side business or your full-time business, you need to have this scalable opportunity where it's not just you physically doing something to get paid. Because if you're running a company where you're the only person that can do something to get paid, then there's no way for you to scale this business beyond you. So you want to be able to build something or create something that can generate revenue without you physically having to do something. Now again, this isn't truly passive income, but it's a way for you to generate income without you physically having to do a task. One way you can do this is kind of like what I just talked about. You can create a product and sell it online and now people will have the ability to buy whatever product you're selling, whether it's socks or supplements or clothes. And now people have the ability to buy your products from your online store any hour of the day from anywhere in the world. Because back in the day, if you started a store, well now people could only buy products from your store when your store was open. So if your store was open nine to five, well then you could only make sales nine to five. And if you weren't that large of a store, then you'd be the person sitting there behind the cash register. And if you weren't sitting there or if somebody wasn't sitting there, then nobody could place an order. Now, thanks to the internet, somebody can place an order on your website or on the Amazon website any hour of the day from anywhere in the world. The internet has made creating new streams of income more accessible than ever, but just because it's accessible does not mean it's easier because now you have to face a whole new set of roadblocks and hurdles to start generating any sort of income online. If you have any sort of product on the internet and you wanna be able to sell it, now what you're gonna be spending your time doing is getting eyeballs onto your product. So if you're selling shirts, you want people who wanna buy your shirts, seeing your shirts, because a percentage of them are gonna be seeing your shirts. So now your time is gonna be spent trying to market your product, running advertisements, doing organic marketing, maybe doing interviews on other platforms where you can get more exposure for your product. So now your time is going to be spent getting exposure for your product, but it's not working in the same way where you have to physically do something in order to get paid. Now your job is to, to grow the exposure and to grow the brand presence, and you can kind of do that on your own schedule. Now, if you really want to build it big, 
It's going to be a lot of work. It's going to take a ton of effort, a ton of work, and a ton of creativity to really get it out there. But once you get past that hurdle, now you'll be able to generate a whole lot more cash flow for marginally more work because you've already built that exposure. It's kind of like writing a book. This used to be the old traditional way of generating quote unquote passive income. It still works today, but the way that book model works is you write a book and now you're going to publish this book or you're going to self publish this book and you're going to get it out there. Now, once this book is out there, you're going to hopefully make a couple of dollars anytime somebody buys your book. And your goal now is to get exposure for this book. Maybe you're going to try to get on the news. Maybe you're going to try to do interviews, but you want to get exposure out there for your book. That way people keep buying your book. And anytime somebody buys your book, whether it's next week or next year, you're going to make a couple dollars. Another way that you can generate this type of income or cash flow is through creating content on the internet. So you can create blog posts, you can create podcasts, or you can create videos like on YouTube. How you doing? The way this works is kind of like what I just talked about. You're going to put out content on the internet and your goal is to kind of own your own piece of digital real estate. You want to own this thing on the internet where people are spending time because now you want to hope that people are spending their own time watching or reading or listening to your content. Now, if people are watching and listening and reading to your content, now advertisers are going to be willing to pay you to place their content on your content. So for example, if you watch some of our YouTube videos, you might see that YouTube places advertisements in front of our videos. Well, YouTube pays us money for putting the advertisements in front of our videos. It's not a ton of money. I think they pay us something like a penny per view. So it's not a ton of money, but if you have a bunch of eyeballs watching your stuff, listening to your stuff or reading your stuff, then these pennies can start to add up. Plus, once you have people taking a look at your stuff, then there's other ways that you can monetize your audience. Maybe you can sell your own products or you can market somebody else's products as an affiliate. There's a lot of different ways that you can start making money once you have that audience. But the whole idea here, when it comes to the whole passive idea, I mean, it's not really passive because it takes a ton of work to do it. But the idea of it being passive is where now you can put out this piece of content once and then somebody can watch it today or a year from now or five years from now because once it's on the internet, it's there until you delete it. The difficult thing about this is, well, it's hard. You have a lot of people on the internet that are trying to create content, that are trying to build businesses doing this, but most people will fail because either you give up or you realize how hard it is because it's not easy to generate that type of attraction. And it's not easy to really start generating the type of revenue doing it. Like when I first started this YouTube channel, I think it took me a year and a couple months before I made $2,000 making videos. So it takes a lot of time, but if you stay consistent with it, if you keep improving, you can build a full business around doing that or a side income, but it takes that time to do that and you have to figure out what it is that you want to do. Or if you already have some cash, some capital, and you're looking for a way that you can really start growing this capital quicker and you don't want to invest your money just into stocks or real estate because you think that growth is too small, then what you can do is you can take this money and use it to buy a business. This might be a franchise or this might be an actual business that you're going to buy out where now you're going to be running this business and this business was already established by somebody else. If you're buying a franchise, you're buying this company's secret sauce. If you're buying an existing company, then you're buying what someone probably spent years building up and establishing. Now, if you're buying an already existing business, it already has cash flow. It's already hopefully profitable. And what you're doing is you're buying the income stream. And now what you want to do is you want to come in and see how you can grow that income stream. So there's a whole bunch of different types of businesses that you can buy. If you have experience in the financial space or if you have experience in the fitness space, there are so many different industries out there and you can buy businesses in any different industry. And once you own this business, this asset, your job is to take this income that you have coming in and hopefully try to grow it with your expertise. Again, this would not be considered passive unless you're just going in as a silent financial partner where you're just investing the money to own a piece of a business and somebody else is going to be running it, which is also a possibility if you have enough capital. But if you're looking for a way for you to grow the money that you have as fast as possible and you don't want to build a business yourself, then you can go out and you can buy a business. Becoming wealthy or financially free is more about what you do with your money after you get paid than it is about how much money you're actually getting paid. Everybody goes through three different phases when you're learning how to become wealthy. The first phase is you learn how to save money. You learn how to live below your means. You learn how to be frugal because now you're just trying to put some extra cash aside. That way you have some extra money to build your wealth. Phase two is all about growth. You're starting to see a little bit of success because now you have some extra cash. And now you're trying to figure out how do you amplify this? How do you grow your money? How do you attract more money? And how can you actually grow your pie? Phase three is all about learning how to spend. How do you spend your money like wealthy people? How do you get the most value 
value out of a dollar? How do you get the most value out of your time? If you really want to enjoy being wealthy, you need to also know how to spend your money because otherwise you're going to be stuck in that phase one mindset because now you're going to have money in the bank and you're going to have investments paying you every single month and you'll be able to afford a much better lifestyle. But if you can't get yourself to go out and spend money, if you can't get yourself to go out and enjoy your life and enjoy the luxuries that you can afford, then you're not going to be able to enjoy your wealthy life. Like I'll tell you for me, I started off by never wanting to go on vacation because I wanted to save every penny possible, phase one. Then I wanted to take every penny that I saved and invest it as aggressively as possible into things like real estate. That way I could create more cash flow, phase two. And then I went from now when I go on a long flight, I don't want to sit in economy. I want to sit in business class. That way I can have some extra leg room. That way I can sit comfortably and sleep on the plane, phase three. The way that you become wealthy is not by having a fancy degree or by earning a big salary. It's by using your money the right way when you get paid. That's why in this video, I'm going to be going over five things that you, especially millennials, need to do right now when you get paid. That way you can become wealthy. The first thing you got to do when you get paid if you want to become wealthy is you have to pay yourself first. See, what the majority of people do is as soon as they get paid, they see the money hit their bank account and then they call up their cousin Bunty and they say, hey Bunty, you want to go to the mall? Cousin Bunty isn't the best influence financially. So now you go over to the Gucci store, the Apple store, the Lululemon store, and now you pay them. You pay Gucci, you pay Apple, you pay Lululemon, and now your money is gone. You have paid Gucci, you have paid Lululemon, you have paid Apple, but you haven't paid yourself. This is right now the majority of financial advice says that if you want to become wealthy, all you gotta do is take a little bit of your paycheck and put it into your 401k or put it into your IRA. Now your 401k and your IRA are great investments for average people. But if you don't want to be average, you can't keep investing your money like average people. You have to do more than that. Have you ever heard of a super rich person talk about how they got rich because of the 401k? No. This is where you gotta think a little bit bigger. So when we talk about paying yourself first, the very first thing you gotta do is you gotta create a financial system. And one of the simplest financial systems that you can follow is our 75, 15, 10 plan, which says that from now on, every dollar that you earn is gonna flow through this system. It's kinda like a funnel where now a dollar flows in and now you tell yourself that 75 cents is the maximum that you can spend, 15 cents is the minimum you should be investing and 10 cents is the minimum that you should be saving. So this is what you spend, this is what you grow, and this is what you save. And this is going to be outside of your 401k and your IRA. The best way to go about doing this is to create three different bank accounts. And anytime you get paid, you have an automatic withdrawal, which is gonna take the money out of your checkings account and move it somewhere else. It's gonna move it into a savings account and it's gonna move it into an investment account. That doesn't necessarily mean that this money is gonna be invested right away. It's just a separate bank account with money that is supposed to be invested. You don't want to keep all this money in one bank account because then you might accidentally spend your investment money on a brand new TV or you might spend your savings on a brand new car. These things need to be separate that we know what's for growing to build your wealth and what's for savings. Now next time you go to the mall with your cousin Bunty, you're not going to be able to give all your money to Gucci and Apple and Amazon because you already paid yourself first. The second thing you do when you get paid is you need to know how to save your money smartly. So now you're following the system. You have three different bank accounts. 75% of every dollar that you earn goes here. 15% of every dollar that you earn goes here. And 10 cents are going into your savings. But one of the worst things that you can do is just save your money forever. So when I was growing up, I was always told that I needed to become a doctor like every other brown person in the world. And the reason why I needed to become a doctor is because I would make a big salary. And the benefit of a big salary is you get to save a whole lot of money. Because now if you make it $300,000 a year, you can save $250,000 a year and live off of 50. The problem with that, there's a lot of problems with that, but the main problem with that on the saving side is your savings are never going to make you wealthy. Sorry, mom and dad, and sorry, uncle, auntie, but you can never save your way to wealth, especially in the economic environment that we're in right now. When you take $1,000 or $10,000 or $100,000 and you save this money in your bank account, your bank is gonna pay you nothing. Your bank is gonna pay you 0.01% a year in interest on your money, while the price of things around you, the price of everything, your housing, your groceries, your vacations, your healthcare, the price of all these things are gonna grow way faster than 0.01% a year. The price of everything around you is getting so expensive while your savings are just sitting there dead. Your savings are not growing. You can never save your way to wealth. The value that savings have are not to make you wealthy. Your savings are supposed to be there to protect you against a financial emergency. So when something goes wrong, when your car breaks down or your kid's arm breaks, now you have some savings you can fall back on that we don't gotta go into debt to pay for this cost. 
This is why your savings are here. You have to understand this if you really want to ever have a shot at becoming wealthy. The only reason why you should be saving money is to protect yourself from a financial emergency. If you want to become wealthy, you have to be growing your money. I'll get to that in just a second. But if you really want to understand this, that means you need to know how much money you need to save and never save a penny more than that. That way you can invest every extra penny. So you want to be saving somewhere between three months and 12 months worth of expenses, depending on how risk tolerant you are. If you have a higher risk tolerance, then you might only need three months worth of your savings sitting in a savings account somewhere. If you're not as risk tolerant and you want to be more safe and more protected financially, then you can put 12 months worth of your expenses in a savings account. After that, you do not want to save another penny because your savings are not going to make you wealthy. So you want to follow this financial system until you hit your savings goal. And once you hit the savings goal, then you want to reroute these savings into your investment money. So now you have 25% of your money minimum being invested, growing to make you wealthy. The third thing you gotta do when you get paid is you need to know how to grow your money. Time is your best friend when we talk about growing your money. So if you're young, this is the best time to start. If you can invest $350 a month between the ages of 21 and 31, and that's all you do. You invest $350 a month every single month and you can get a decent 8% return on your money and after the age of 31, you don't invest another penny. You just let the money compound at the same rate until you retire. You will be able to retire a millionaire even if you never invest another penny after you turn 31. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't invest another penny after 31. You wanna keep investing aggressively, that way you can build more wealth, but this is the power of time and knowing how to grow your money the right way. So how do you actually go about growing this money? Well, the first thing you gotta do is you need to have some cash to invest. So you want to take this cash, put it in a separate bank account that we have some money to invest. And this is where you got to figure out your investment strategy. If you want to be completely passive, you don't want to even think about your investments because you don't like doing that. Well, then you can just invest your money into ETFs on the stock market. If you like the stock market, but you want to be more involved, then you can look at individual stocks and investing in. If you want to be more hands-on and you want to get consistent cash flow, then you can invest your money into real estate. You don't have to do just one or the other. I do all three of these things, but you have to understand what your goal is, what your strategy is, and you need the cash to do that. I own rental properties and I'm always looking for more real estate investment deals, and these properties are paying me rent every single month. I also have money in the market where I'm looking for individual stocks. I look for stocks that I believe in, that I think are undervalued, that I wanna own for the long term. I put my money into them and then I hold on to them for years. I also have a passive investment strategy where every single week I have some money being taken out of my checking account, going into the stock market, into a few different ETFs. That way I get exposure to the stock market. So you don't have to only stick with one strategy, but you gotta start with one and you gotta know what your goal is with each strategy that you do. You gotta understand, if you wanna become wealthy, this is what is going to make you wealthy. It's not going to be this and it's not gonna be this. You buying nice cars, nice clothes, and a big house is not gonna make you wealthy. You going out and saving all of your money in the bank is not gonna make you wealthy. If you really want to become wealthy, and I'm not just talking about average wealthy, I'm talking about really wealthy, you need to be focusing here. How can you grow your money more? If you are serious about becoming wealthy, then there are two rules that I want you to follow. Rule number one, before you buy a home to live in, buy a property to rent out. And number two, anytime you spend a dollar, invest a dime. The home that you're living in is not going to make you rich. Sure, you can make money on your home if you sell it for more than what you bought it for, but if you really wanna become wealthy, you wanna think of your home as a liability, as something that you just use, and you wanna think of rental properties as an investment, because these are things that you're buying for the sole purpose of making money, and they will pay you every single month as you wait until you sell this property. One of the biggest changes that you can make is before you go out and you buy a home to live in yourself, you go out and you buy a rental property. Then, after you have this rental property, then you can think about buying a home, and now the rental property that you own will pay for your mortgage for you. And once you start to see the type of cash flow, you're gonna wanna do it again and again and again. That way you can ramp up that cash flow. And now you have cash flow producing assets that are paying for your expenses. I didn't grow up learning about real estate investing or passive income or investing in general. This was something I fell into. When I was 19 years old, I invested into my first real estate investment property. I was in college, I had some cash in the bank because I was running an event planning business at the time. And this was back right after the real estate crash the 2008 crash, so real estate prices were rock bottom. I had no idea what I was doing, but every book that I read, every wealth book that I read, said that wealthy people own real estate. I had no idea what that meant, because I didn't know any real estate investors, but I went out and I bought my first property. It was a small little condo. I wasn't going to live there myself. I was renting it out to somebody else, and this condo, after paying all of my expenses, put $250 into my pocket, 
every single month. And after getting it all situated, I didn't have to do any work. This was cash flow coming into my pocket every single month, whether I went to work or whether I didn't go to work. Remember, your wealth is built here. It's not built here and it's not built here. So if you want to become wealthy, you have to put extra emphasis on putting your money into places where you're gonna be getting paid. The second simple change that you can make is anytime you spend a dollar, invest a dime. Before you go out and you spend a thousand dollars on a brand new iPhone, take a hundred dollars and invest it into the Apple company. Next time you go out and you spend $20,000 on a brand new car, take $2,000 and put it into the car company. Now what you're doing is you have a producer first mindset. You're not just thinking about spending your money, you're thinking about owning the asset where you're spending the money. So now you're shifting your mindset from just a consumer to a producer. You're building that wealth mindset and you're really putting your money where your wallet is. The fourth thing you gotta do now is you get paid as you started to build this wealth is you gotta know how to spend your money like wealthy people do. Here's the thing, wealthy people are not drowning themselves in debt just so they can buy Rolex. And they're not stretching themselves thin to go and buy a Gucci wallet. And they're not opening up a brand new credit card to go shop at Louis Vuitton. So when we talk about spending like the wealthy, the first thing you gotta understand when it comes to these things, which are luxuries, liabilities, things that don't put any money in your pocket, no more financing these things, period. If it doesn't put any money in your pocket, you should not be financing it. Second, when it comes to these things, which don't make you any money, which are not necessities, you gotta know what you can actually afford because there's a difference between being able to buy something and being able to afford something. You can walk into the Apple store and walk out with a thousand dollar iPhone by paying only $50 today. But just because you can qualify to buy something does not mean that you can afford it. If you want to be able to afford something, the easiest thing that you can do is just follow a rule of five, which says if you cannot buy five of them, you cannot afford one of them. Now, as you start to build your wealth, you're gonna get a little bit more sophisticated. How can you use your money to give you the most value? How can you use your money to enjoy your money? Because now you're becoming wealthy. Well, the first thing you gotta do is you gotta make sure now that you're protecting your assets. You wanna make sure that you're protecting protecting your wealth. That means having things like insurance. It's a small price you pay today to protect you against a big headache in the future. That means having things like wills and trusts. That way you know how your money and your assets are going to be divided after you die. The reason why I'm telling you this is because I'm a licensed attorney. I've heard of horror stories of people dying with a lot of money, a lot of assets, with no will, no trust, and no direction on what to do with their money after they die. And now you create this huge family fight, this financial mess, and then the government comes in and they have to decide what to do with your money. You don't want the government telling your family what to do with your money. So think ahead and start thinking about how to protect your assets. And when it comes to protecting your family, the goal is for you to have assets that your family can fall back on. That way, even if you were to die tragically, your family would have assets that they can rely on financially. So at least your family would be okay. Until you get to that point, you want to have life insurance as protection for your family. Because if you are a breadwinner for your family and you were to suddenly die tragically and now your family lost your stream of income, you want to make sure that your family can still afford their lifestyle, they can still afford their standard of life without your income. The way you can do that is by having something like life insurance because the way life insurance works is if you were to die unexpectedly within your life insurance term then your life insurance company would come in and they would give your family a big check that way at least they're okay financially. The good thing about life insurance is it doesn't have to cost you a whole lot of money either. Like if you're a healthy 30 year old guy, you could get a million dollar life insurance policy for something around $30 a month. Now when we talk about spending money like the wealthy, the thing that you have to remember is that you can always get more money but the one thing that you cannot get more of is time. So when we talk about how to use your money smartly now, you wanna use your money in a way that's gonna get you the most value out of your time. Because we were talking about real estate investing just a minute ago, let me give you an example of what I mean through real estate investing. So when you invest in real estate, the way it works is you buy a rental property and then somebody's gonna live in this property and they're gonna pay you rent every single month. Now there's two ways that you can manage this property. You can manage this property yourself, so you have to find the tenant, you have to qualify the tenant. Anytime something's wrong with the property, the tenant's gonna be calling you and it's gonna be your responsibility to pay all the bills and to make sure all the day-to-day -day things are done with the rental property. The alternative is you can hire a property management company. They'll charge you somewhere between 4% and 10% of your gross rental income and in exchange, they'll make it completely hands-off for you. They'll find the tenants, they'll qualify them, they'll deal with all the headaches that come with managing a property. So if the toilet breaks, your property management company will be the ones that fix it and they'll be the ones that pay all the bills. So all you gotta do is find the properties and give the keys to your property management company. A lot of people, when they get started with real 
real estate investing don't want to pay $100 a month to a property management company because they say, hey, I can just do this myself. But the thing that you're sacrificing to do it yourself is you're sacrificing your time. This is something that you can't get back. And so you gotta remember, what do you wanna be in the business of? Do you wanna be in the business of managing your properties or do you wanna be in the business of finding more investment deals? Now, as we're talking about spending your money like the wealthy, what you wanna do is you wanna use your money to free up your time, that way you have more time to do whatever you want. And maybe that thing that you wanna do is do more things that will attract you more money. So when we talk about spending like the wealthy, you gotta figure out which things are important to you. Do you like luxury? Do you like having more free time to spend with your family? Do you like going on exotic vacations? Figure out the things that are important to you and be okay spending your money on these things because this is what you're working so hard for. This can be hard if you really get stuck into the whole idea of trying to save every last penny. That's how I grew up. I grew up being told that I need to save as much money as possible, that I should not waste money, that I should not spend more than I need to. But then as you start to see more financial success and you want to start enjoying your money, you want to be okay spending your money. I've been spending a lot of time in Airbnbs recently. And most recently, I stayed at an Airbnb in Chicago for just over a month, and I could have gotten an Airbnb for a couple thousand dollars, but I wanted something nicer. I wanted something where I had a nice city view and a great location. So instead, I picked an Airbnb that cost me more than $10,000 for one month. Now you can hear that and say, oh, who the heck needs to pay $10,000 for one month just to live somewhere? And you're right, you can live somewhere a whole lot cheaper, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted a nicer location. I wanted a nicer view and I wanted a nicer unit and I could afford it because of the previous steps that I talked about. I still got that voice in the back of my head saying, Just breathe, why are you wasting so much money? But it goes back to this, spending money like the wealthy. What are you working so hard for and being willing to spend money on the things that are important to you and that give you the most value in your life? And this brings me to the fifth thing you need to do when you get paid. Now you have a financial system. You know how to save, you know how to grow, you know how to spend. But if you wanna get there faster, you need to put more money into your funnel, which means you gotta know how to earn more money. Now there's a couple of aspects to this. You have the financial aspect and you got the time aspect. The financial aspect might be investing in classes, investing in books, investing in more education, so you know different ways that you can earn more money. It could also mean investing in other businesses. Maybe you're gonna buy a business. Maybe you're gonna buy a part ownership in a business. This way you have more money coming in. There's a Lot of different things you can do. The internet makes this more accessible than ever. Where now you can create a side hustle doing what you love. You can create a blog, you can start a podcast, you can start a YouTube channel. And these are all things that as you start to grow them will create a new stream of income for you. On the time side of things, you gotta decide how much time you really wanna devote to earning more money. Because if you do want to achieve this financial success faster, you are gonna have to earn more money. And one of the ways you can do that is by investing more time into things that can earn you more money. That means maybe you're gonna spend more of your time building a side business or building a second business. All the things that I just talked about are more accessible than ever, but that doesn't mean it's easy. You have a lot of people on the internet that are trying to create content, that are trying to get eyeballs on them, that are trying to make money on the internet, but the people that really make it are the people that invest back into the education. That way you can learn how to actually make money. You know the formula, you know the system, you know what it takes. Now what you have to do is you gotta amplify the system. How do you get there faster? The way you get there faster is by throwing more fuel into the fire. In this case, it's by putting more money into the funnel. The way you can get more money is by investing more of your money and more of your time into things that will earn you more money. We're gonna jump back into the video in just a second, but before we do, if you're an investor and you're looking to get better returns on your money, I can help you. I've been investing my money for over a decade now, and what I've learned is that the number one way to make more money on your investments is by actually investing your money and then by learning from your mistakes. But this can be very time consuming and very expensive. That's why the second best thing that you can do is by learning from other successful investors. Learn from their successes and learn from their mistakes. That's why I created Market Insiders, which is an investing education app where you'll get access to top level successful investors in the real estate, stock market, and cryptocurrency space. Every week Week, you'll get access to group coaching calls where you'll learn how to be a better stock market, real estate, and cryptocurrency investor. So if this sounds like something that would be beneficial to you and your investment portfolio, I'll put the link to where you can try out Market Insiders for free with a 10-day free trial in the description below. Statistically speaking, if you are under the age of 45, it is harder for you to plan for retirement and budget for retirement. It's harder for you to afford a car and it's harder for you to afford a home because the cost of living has grown way faster than your wages. Wages have gone up over the last 50 years. The problem is wages just haven't gone up as fast as our cost of living. And not just that, we also have a higher standard of living today because 50 years ago, nobody had a cell phone in their hand. Nobody had a MacBook. Nobody had AirPods. And so now not only do 
we have higher costs relative to our wages, we also have more costs. Couple that with the fact that the Federal Reserve Bank is really focused on today. They refuse to slow down their money printing and they refuse to slow down their stock market bailouts every single month because they don't want to see a stock market slow down. They don't want to see a stock market tantrum, which is why they keep printing money and bailing out the markets every single month, which in turn comes back to kick millennials right in the, you know what, their extra guacamole. There are two reasons why Americans are poorer, financially poorer today than they were 50 years ago. The first reason has to do with society. And we're talking about the cost of living growth relative to wages. And second are spending habits of people, especially in America. This is something that's out of your control as a person. These are your wage increases relative to your cost of living increases relative to the standard of living increases. As you live through life, the prices of things are going to go up thanks to something called inflation. As the value of our dollars get diluted, the price of things go up. And as the price of things go up, now you have to go to the grocery store and pay more money to buy your groceries. This is what everybody talks about when we compare wages today relative to wages 50 years ago. Wages have gone up over the last 50 years, but wages have not gone up at the speed of our cost of living. Housing prices have gone up, the price to buy a car has gone up, the price of groceries have gone up, the price of going on vacation has gone up way faster than what people's wages have gone up by. This is out of your control, and this is one of the reasons why people are broker today, at least the average people are broker today, than they were 50 years ago. On the flip side, we also have an extreme spending culture, which is fueling people's brokenness because you have easy access to debt and the easy ability to buy whatever you want. Right now, we have a spending culture where people want to show off their brand new Lululemon leggings. They want to show off their Gucci belt. They want to show off their Louis Vuitton purses. And now, how do you buy these things if you don't have $2,000 in your wallet to go out and buy that purse? Well, now you can just go out and put it on your credit card. And even if you don't do that and you're shopping online, you can use something like a firm or Afterpay. You can buy it now and pay it later thanks to the help of all this brand new technology which lets you have whatever you want today and you can just pay it off in installments with a little bit of interest or a lot of bit of interest. This is something that we can control. What we do with our money, how we spend our money, and how we invest our money. I'll save this for a little bit later because this is going to be the cure of how you get out of this financial mess, but let's focus on this right now. The cost of living has really gone up over the last 50 years, and we've really seen it ramp up over the last 10 years. And so now, if you are a millennial, you're a young person, and you want to go out and buy a home, or even if you want to go out and rent a home, it's a lot more expensive now. That's why so many millennials are being priced out of the housing market just because they can't afford homes in this housing market. This leads me to the question, why are things getting so expensive right now? And to answer that, you really have to understand inflation because inflation is when the value of your currency, the value of your dollars goes down. The easiest way to understand inflation is just to understand supply and demand. When there are more dollars in circulation, the value of each dollar that you have, the value of each dollar that you have in your bank account, the value of each dollar that you get in your paycheck, the value of each dollar goes down as more and more money is created and enters our economic system. And so when you hear about things like the United States government, the first thing you want to think of is the United States national debt. If you went out to the mall and you go shopping and you buy a whole bunch of nice and expensive things and now you come home and then you see a credit card bill and oh my God, your credit card bill is $10,000 and you don't have $10,000 to pay off your credit card bill, now you will have $10,000 with the credit card debt, which you will now have to pay off over time. The way you pay off your credit card debt is now you're gonna have to go to work every single day, you make money from your job, and then some of this money is gonna have to go to pay off your credit card debt, and you're gonna have to keep doing that until you pay off all your credit card debt plus interest. The United States government works kind of the same way. The United States government, when they spend money that they don't have, they have to borrow this money from somewhere else. They might borrow this money from other countries, or they're gonna work with the Federal Reserve Bank who prints this money, and then they give this money to the United States government. Then the United States government borrows this money from the Federal Reserve Bank, they spend it to help improve the economy or do whatever they wanna do, and then the United States government has to pay this money back plus interest. But how does the United States government get this money to pay off all this national debt? Well, the United States government makes their money from people like you and me through taxes. So when you go to work every single day, a portion of your money is going straight to the government, the IRS, to pay taxes, and the government is gonna use more and more of that money to pay off the national debt. But if we stick on the topic of inflation, anytime you hear that the United States wants to spend more money that they don't have, that means that there's gonna to have to be more money printed because they're gonna to have to borrow this money from the Federal Reserve Bank, and the Federal Reserve Bank, although it's called the Federal Reserve Bank, is really not a bank because you and I can't go there to deposit 
deposit money or withdraw money. It's not a reserve because they're not sitting on any cash reserves and they're not federal. It even says so on their website. So when the Federal Reserve Bank has to give money to the United States, they print this money essentially out of thin air and then they give this money to the United States. The United States national debt goes up and then the United States government will take this new money and they will inject it into our economy. In the short term, this is great because it boosts the economy. All this new money is added into the economy. But as this money starts to flow through the economic system, what happens is the value of our dollars get diluted because as more and more dollars enter our economic system, the value of each dollar that we have, again, the value of each dollar in your bank account, the value of each dollar that you go to work every single day to earn, the value of each dollar starts to go down, which causes the price of things to go up. That's why when you go to the grocery store, it costs more money to buy groceries today than it did 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And that's why vacations get more expensive. And that's why housing costs keep going up because the value of our dollars get diluted. Now, going back to the Federal Reserve Bank, the interesting thing about the Federal Reserve Bank is they are an entity that controls our monetary supply. They help monitor the money printing. They work with the Treasury Department to do that. And they also monitor interest rates and they can change interest rates depending on what's going on in the economy. So the Federal Reserve Bank has a lot of control and a lot of power over our monetary supply. And so if you really want to understand what's going on with inflation, you really have to understand what the Federal Reserve Bank is doing. The first and most obvious thing is interest rates. When interest rates are low, more people are likely to go out and borrow money, which means more dollars are going to enter our economic system, which creates more inflation. Now, this is great news if you go out and you're borrowing a few hundred thousand dollars to go out and buy a hard asset like a house, because now you get to borrow money very cheap. But it also creates more inflation on the back end because more dollars will enter our economic system. The second thing you have to understand is the money printing by the Federal Reserve Bank because right now the Federal Reserve Bank is printing something around 120 billion dollars every single month and they're injecting this money into our markets to buy bonds to help keep our stock market and our financial markets afloat. See, the Federal Reserve Bank is very worried that if they stop this money printing and they stop these bond buybacks, that investors will get scared and then they will sell their stocks and they will be less likely to invest their money into the financial markets. If that happens, then we could see stock prices go down, we could see asset prices go down, and that's not good news for investors. And so to prevent that from happening, the Federal Reserve Bank is continuing to print this money and they're doing this every single month and they're injecting this money into the asset markets and the bond markets to keep investors confident and to keep people investing their money in the market. We saw almost the exact same thing happen back during the 2008 crash because we saw the same thing. We saw a financial meltdown. So the Federal Reserve Bank was printing money every single month to buy up assets, to keep investors confident and to keep them investing their money in the market. But then one day the Federal Reserve Bank decided that our economy was growing and they don't need to do that anymore. So they stopped the money printer and they stopped putting money into the markets. And as soon as that happened, we saw a small stock market crash. This was back in 2013 and it was called the taper tantrum. And so now the Federal Reserve Bank is trying to learn from their mistakes and they don't want that to happen again. They don't want the stock market to crash. So every single month, they keep injecting their money into the market to keep bailing it out because they don't want to see the stock market slow down. And in exchange, you are going to be the one paying the price through inflation unless you're financially educated. Remember, inflation is what causes the price of things to go up. And what we've seen happen decade over decade over decade is that the price of things, our cost of living is growing faster than wages. So yeah, we're seeing the price of wages go up, which is great, but we're not seeing wages grow as fast as the cost of living, which is not so good news. And so as we see more inflation, the people that pay the price for that literally are the majority of people who are not financially educated. That's why inflation is known as a silent tax because it hurts the people who don't understand it. This is the issue that we're facing right now. The Federal Reserve Bank knows that we're seeing higher inflation. The Federal Reserve Bank knows that it's harder for people to go out and afford groceries. The Federal Reserve Bank knows that it's more expensive for people to afford the housing costs. The Federal Reserve Bank knows that inflation is hurting people who are not financially educated. But in order to avoid a stock market slowdown, they will continue to keep printing this money and bailing out investors. This is why financial education is so important because now who's going to be the people paying the price? It's the younger people, millennials, generation Zers, who are not financially educated because inflation hurts the people who are not financially educated. So this is what's going on right now. We have monetary policies out there which are continuing to ramp up inflation because the people who are in charge don't want to see these asset prices slow down. And in return, the people who are going to be paying the price are the people who are not financially educated. This brings me to the second side of things. What should you be doing with your money right now. That way you can protect your wallet and build your wealth in this crazy economic system. What you want to be doing now, that way you can benefit from this whole economic system, is you need to own assets which grow when you see more inflation. 
The reality for so many people is right now, if you get $1,000 in your wallet, what do people do? You're gonna go out to the store, you're gonna give it to Gucci, you're gonna give it to Apple, you're gonna give it to Amazon, you're gonna give it to Lululemon, and then you're gonna give yourself nothing. What I want you to do from now on is for a little while, you gotta stop giving everybody else all your money because you're making all of them rich. You're making Apple, Amazon, Gucci, Lululemon rich, but you're keeping yourself broke. So what I need you to do is I want you to take this money, put it back in your pocket, and then use this money to buy something that's gonna make you rich. The thing that wealthy people do with their money is when they make money, before they go out and spend it on all these nice things, is they spend it on assets. They buy things that will make them money first, and then when their assets make them money, that's the money that they go out and spend at Gucci, Lululemon, Amazon, and Apple. Now, unlike what a lot of financial experts say, I'm not saying that you need to sacrifice all of life's luxuries. I'm not saying you shouldn't own any designer clothes. I'm not saying you shouldn't drive a luxury car. I'm not saying you shouldn't go on fancy vacations. I want you to have all that nice stuff. I want you to live your dream life. I just want you to be able to afford it first. Because right now, the first thing you gotta do is you need to get a hold of some of these assets that are gonna put money in your pocket. Because if you don't have any assets, you're gonna be the person paying the price with the high inflation. Because what happens when we see inflation is you're gonna have to pay more money to the store. So what I want you to do is I want you to own a piece of the store that way when the store makes more money, so do you. That means taking some of your extra cash right now and using it to buy stocks, using it to buy real estate, rental properties, using it to buy business businesses that we own these assets which are working hard to earn you more money. Because at the end of the day, you can never become wealthy off of your salary alone. Because as soon as you stop working, your salary is gonna stop coming in. So what you need to do is you gotta go to work every single day, you're gonna get this paycheck. Now, you wanna take some of this paycheck and start buying more assets. You wanna buy as many assets as you can, that way these assets can start paying you. Where you go with that now is gonna depend on your goals. Maybe you want cash flow. I love investing in real estate because real estate gives me cash flow. When I buy a rental property, I know this property is gonna pay me every single month as long as I have tenants in there and as long as I own the property. Some people like to own stocks because you have the opportunity to see a lot of appreciation. You can buy a stock for $100 a share and if you own a great company that's innovating for the future, you can see the stock price go up to $200 a share. Other people wanna take their money and they wanna buy their own businesses. They wanna manage their own businesses. They wanna be really involved. So you gotta figure out what your goal is and how involved you wanna be with your investments. The thing that's the most important here is you have to understand the difference between being a producer and being a consumer. Because if you are just a consumer, meaning anytime you get paid, you're just going out and you're spending that money, you're paying your rent, you're paying your mortgage, you're going to the mall, you're buying all these nice things, you're going on vacation, and then you have no money for yourself to buy these assets, you're just a consumer. You're the person that's making everybody else around you rich. You need to build that producer mindset where now you wanna own a piece of the assets. If you go out and you buy shares on the stock market of Amazon or Lululemon or Apple, you become one of the owners of these companies. When they make more money, so do you. When you go out and you buy rental properties, you own a piece of real estate. Now you own an asset that's gonna be producing you cash flow and if real estate prices go up, now the value of your real estate went up. If you own a business and now you see more inflation and the price of things are going up, well now you can charge more money for your business. The unfortunate thing is this is something that we're not taught in school. We're never taught how to manage our money. We're never taught how to protect our money against inflation. We're never taught how to build wealth. We're never taught how to own assets. We're never taught how to create cash flow that we can live off of your investments instead of just living to work every single day at your job. These are things that you have to go out of your way to learn. This is what financial education is all about. In general, you have two different types of income. You have active income, and then you have passive income. Let me grab a different back marker. Active income is the money that you earn from, oh yeah, look at that black, from your job. You go to work, you run a business, you do something, you do a task, you get paid. This is your active income. Passive income is money you make without you doing anything. You put your money someplace, so you make money here, you put your money here, and now this money comes automatically into your bank account. Every Monday, you got a $1,000 check deposited into your account, boom, passive income. But the thing about passive income is sometimes it's not always so passive, and there's a few things you gotta understand to actually start earning this passive income. The thing that every single wealthy person does 
is they try to make money here, not so they can have a big salary, so they can have a big home and a nice car and nice watches. The reason why they're working to get a big salary or big income here is so they can take more money and put it towards their investments here that are gonna pay them without having to work. Because at the end of the day, there's only a limited amount of work that each one of us can do. There's a limited amount of hours in each day. There's a limited amount of work that we can all do, but your money doesn't have that cap. Your money is scalable. Your efforts are not. There's a limit to how much effort you can put in, but there's no limit to how much money your money can earn you. So what every wealthy person is trying to do is they're trying to make more money here. That way they have more money working for them here. That's what I want you to do. But now the thing that you need to understand about passive income is that first, passive income isn't always passive. Let me start by giving you an example of my first exposure to passive income through real estate. So when I first started reading books about money management and investing and business, pretty much every book said that wealthy people invest in real estate because real estate gives you passive income. Now, I didn't know what real estate investing was. I didn't know that you could buy rental properties and get cash flow from that. All I knew from reading these books was that wealthy people were investing in real estate and the way it works according to these books is you buy this property then you find somebody, let's draw a nice mustache, and for our female followers, I'm gonna draw you right here a braid, or as we call it in my native language, Punjabi, a gut. So you find this nice person or family, and they're gonna live in the property, and every single month, they're gonna send you a $1,000 check for living in your property. Now, some of this $1,000 is gonna go to pay your taxes, your mortgage, your insurance, your maintenance fees, your management fees, and the remainder goes in your pocket. So this is an easy way for you to start generating some passive income because you can buy a property, let somebody else pay your mortgage, and you're done. Except it doesn't really work like that. See, the thing that nobody tells you about this type of passive income is it takes a lot of work to get started in order for any of this to be passive. Because when I first started investing in real estate, it was anything but passive. I had to first find out how do you find an investment property? How do you find a real estate agent? How do you find a good property? You know, every book says you need to walk through, I think, 20 to 50 deals before you actually buy one property. It takes a lot of time to walk through all of these properties. And then you're gonna have to find a building inspector. You gotta figure out how do you find the issues. When you find the issues in a property, you have to find contractors, deal with contractors, negotiate these contracts, make sure they do the work right, and you gotta work with the city hall. Make sure that your property is in compliance. Make sure that you're certified as a rental. Make sure that you have all the licenses and permits that you need. Once you do that, now you gotta find a good management company. I had worked with scam and fake management companies. They're not always so straightforward. You gotta know who is a good management company, who is a bad management company. You gotta know what questions to ask these people. Once you find a good management company, you have to manage the management company. If they're a good management company, then you're gonna be pretty much hands off. But if they're a bad management company, because I have worked with my share of bad management companies, you gotta be on their tail to make sure that they're doing their end of the work. And so now you gotta make sure that, okay, now this property is ready, now you gotta find the tenants. Now, if you have a good management company, you can do this completely hands-free. Your management company's gonna do this for you. But I have dealt with bad management companies where now I had to find my own tenants, I had to screen my own tenants, and then I had to make sure that my own tenants were paying rent. That is the management company's job. But if you don't know how to invest in real estate and you don't know how to find a good management company, now this is your job and this is your work. And so what was supposed to be passive income all of a sudden became a big headache. Now the reason why I'm telling you all of this is not to deter you away from real estate investing. The reason why I'm telling you this is because I want you to understand the truth behind passive income because a lot of people make passive income seem like all fairy tales and rainbows that is so easy. All you gotta do is go buy a property, you go to go do this, and then all of a sudden you're gonna be raining cash because you have done what this has told you to do. You've taken these five steps and all of a sudden every Monday you got a thousand dollars hidden in your bank account. That's why a better word for this type of income rather than just passive income is cash flow. Because what cash flow is, it's this income coming into your property. Cash is flowing into your account. Now it's gonna still require work. After you find your property, you gotta make sure that your property is still in a good area. If you see this area start depreciating, you see a lot of bad things happening in this area, you might have to sell this property, you might wanna move out, you might wanna make renovations. And yeah, you can have a management company help you with that. But the more involved you are, the more kind of upside that you will have in your property because now you're making decisions, you're doing the research, and you're understanding, okay, yeah, here's what I need to do with my investments. You don't wanna be involved in the day-to-day -day things. You don't wanna be the person that's plunging toilets. You don't wanna be the person that's dealing with tenants. You wanna be the investor. And the investor is the person that is managing the properties, that is managing their investments. You're not doing the day-to-day -day management. You're the person that's looking at the area. 
Where do I want my investments to be? Where do I need to move my money around? Where do I need this money to go? So this is what I need you to do. And that requires work. So me as a real estate investor, yeah, I have properties that are generating me cash flow. But just because I don't have to manage each individual property doesn't mean that it's completely passive because I'm always looking for more deals. I'm always looking to see where our business is going. I'm always looking to see trends. Where are people moving to? These are things that I'm working on. So yeah, this is money that's coming in passively, but I'm still putting in work. And it took a lot of work for me to get to where I am today because I had to go through a lot of hurdles. I had to go through a lot of setbacks in order to get there. I had to learn a lot of different things. So it takes a lot of work to get to the passive state, but even at the passive state, you still gotta keep putting in the work to make sure that your properties are still generating good profits. This is where everybody says, oh, just breathe. Real estate isn't really passive because real estate requires a lot of work. You gotta buy properties, you gotta manage them and do all that. That's why you should get your passive income from stocks. The way stocks work is now you are investing in individual companies. And now when you invest in these companies, you get to share in their profits. One of the ways the companies share the profits is by taking some of the extra cash in the bank account and just giving it away to shareholders in the form of dividends. So if you own a company, every three months they might send you some money just because you invested in that company. Now the issue here is yes, this money is passive. If you go out and you invest in the McDonald's company, you own a piece of the McDonald's corporation and then every three months, McDonald's is gonna send you a check, a dividend, just because you invested in the company. You don't gotta flip burgers, you don't gotta be involved in any of the meetings, you just get a check because you invested in the company and you get your share of the profits. Now, while this is passive in the sense of you don't have to do any work to manage the company, it isn't passive in the sense that you gotta keep doing your research. You gotta make sure that your investment is still a good one. Because just because a company is paying a dividend today, doesn't mean they're always gonna keep paying a dividend in the future. AT&T is a great example of this. AT&T was a company that everybody looked at as a massive dividend paying company. For the last number of decades, they increased the amount of money that they were paying out in dividends year after year after year. And they did this for decades. So everybody looked at AT&T as a very safe dividend play. If you want consistent cash flow, just invest your money into the AT&T stock. Well, in 2021, AT&T came out and they slashed their dividend almost in half. And so now all of a sudden, this company that was paying out massive dividends, massive passive income just for you investing in it, all of a sudden changed their strategy. And so this is where now, again, yes, it's passive in the sense that you can get cash flow without you having to physically do any work, but it's not passive in the sense that you gotta make sure you keep doing your research. If you are an AT&T investor and you're investing just for dividends, this is where now you have to put in some more research and understand, is this still a good investment based off of your strategy? And if not, what is a good investment for you? So the things that you're gonna be doing now is you still have to pay attention to earnings calls. You gotta pay attention to what the company is doing. You gotta pay attention to the management because if you know what the management's goals are, if you know that they wanna invest more aggressively in growth, they might not have extra cash to pay out in dividends because if they're paying this money out to shareholders, they don't have that money to reinvest back into the company. So these are things that you have to pay attention to. Who is the manager company? How are they innovating? What are they creating for the future? And so now if you are investing in stocks, yes, these dividends are completely passive because you don't gotta go to work to earn them. But it's not passive in the sense that if you wanna maintain this cash flow that you're getting from stocks, you gotta keep doing your research. So now let's take a step back and really understand what's going on. For you to generate any sort of cash flow, I don't care what type of cash we're talking about, for you to generate any sort of cash flow, what you have to do is you have to create some sort of value, okay? And we could talk about this from an active sense or a passive sense. From an active sense, if you wanna create value, you might go out and you might create a brand new, amazing guacamole recipe. Once you create this guacamole recipe, you build the guacamole, you gotta sell it, and now you've created value, and if people like it, now you have created cash flow from your guacamole business. This is an active way because you gotta be actively involved to create the recipe, to build the guacamole, to sell the guacamole, but if you can do that, now you've just created cash flow. On the passive side of things, the way you can create value, well, now you can go out and you can buy a house. When you own a house, you have something of value because people wanna live in your property. So you've just created value by buying this value. Now when people live in this property, they have a place to live, right? That's the value that you created, and now they're gonna pay you for living in your property. So they're gonna pay you for this value because you bought this asset, you bought this value, this house. You can do the same thing on the other side. If you don't wanna create your own guacamole recipe and your own guacamole business, if you have the cash, you can go out and you can buy your own guacamole business, right? The same concept. 
is do you want to create it yourself or do you want to buy it? Now the difference between you going out and buying a guacamole business and you going out and buying a home is the passiveness. Because if you went out and you bought a guacamole business, you could generate good cash flow assuming that it's profitable. But the issue is if you want to grow it, if you want to keep scaling it, and if you want to maintain it, you're going to have to put in more work, right? Because you're going to have to keep updating the recipe. You're going to want to get it in more storage. There's a lot more things involved in managing a guacamole business than there is in managing a rental property. Because with a rental property, assuming that the property is in decent shape, somebody just has to live there and pay rent every single month. That's a lot simpler to manage than an entire guacamole business. And so people like the idea of owning cash flow or passive income from real estate because the amount of work required to get this passive income or cash flow in this case from real estate is a lot simpler than from buying a whole guacamole business. Now you can substitute this guacamole business with anything you want. This is why people are attracted to franchises because now you're going out and you're buying a business, right? You can buy a 7-Eleven, you can buy a UPS, you can buy a McDonald's if you go through all of the training. Once you go through that training, you have this asset, now you have something that should be producing you cash flow, but it requires more work than if you just went out and you bought a rental property. These different type of assets also come with different types of returns. Like a rental property might give you a 7% return. That would be considered a good return in the real estate investing world. When it goes to buying a business, now you're gonna wanna see something a whole lot larger because you're gonna be actively involved. Now you might be looking for a 20 or 25, maybe even a 30% return on your cash because you're also investing your time, right? So when it comes to value, there's two different ways that you can derive this value. One is from your money and one is from your time. When we're talking more about the passive type of investments, we're focusing more here, right? We're not talking about buying businesses. We're not talking about buying franchises because these things require a lot of time. And if we're talking about passive investments, we're talking here. Now, obviously you can get a better return on your money here, but now you also have more of your time sacrificed. Here, you have less of your time involved, but it's gonna take more money. Now, the next thing you gotta understand is that if you wanna get a better return on your passive investments, you gotta invest more money. And this is where a lot of people get these two things confused because they're talking about investing their money for passive income, but they want 100% return a year, which is a very hard thing to do when you're talking about passive income because again, when we talk about passive income, you're only investing your money, not your time. And so this is where you have to really understand what is passive income? What type of cash flow are you looking for? Are you looking for something that's truly passive, that doesn't require your time on your end, where now you can just go out and buy this asset and your time is spent on the overall higher management stage? Or do you wanna buy something and be in the individual managed stage where now you're buying a business or you're buying a franchise and now you're working to build and grow this franchise or this business? The whole idea behind being wealthy is now you have assets that are paying for your lifestyle. But in order for that to happen, you have to have this type of passive income, this type of cash flow, where you're not actively doing the work to get paid. The only way you can do that is if you take money either from your active investments here or from your job, and now you're taking this money and you're putting it here. So you gotta understand now, where are you earning your money from? Because it's very hard for somebody to just go out and start earning their money here. And most people don't just win the lottery right out of college, right? And so you can't just go and expect to earn a living out of this type of passive income because it takes a lot of cash to do that. Remember, a good real estate return is something like 7% a year. So if you wanna earn $70,000 a year, you're gonna have to invest a million dollars to do that based off of that 7% return. So you gotta understand what kind of returns we're talking about here. And so in order to get this, now you gotta have other cash, either from your active investments or from your business or from your job going in here. Now this is where, if you wanna amplify this, you gotta have more money going here. How do you get more money? Well, now you can ask for a raise. You can work to get a promotion. You can work to get a second job. You can start a side business. You can start a side hustle. You can do some more active investments. This is where you have to figure out how can you work in a way that's gonna earn you more income because you wanna take this higher income and put it here towards your passive investments. This is not gonna give you the best return on your money, but this is the thing that's gonna make you wealthy because it will pay you consistently. Yeah, it's not completely passive because you still gotta spend your time doing the higher management, but you're not actively involved in the day-to-day -day work. So you wanna start generating this passive income. Good, you have to start doing that. Every wealthy person does this. Is it gonna happen overnight? No, this is gonna take time. Every time you get paid now, you wanna be putting more money towards your passive investments, whether it's stocks, whether it's real estate. You wanna have some sort of cash flow because this is money that can supplement your income. Now, as you start doing this, you're gonna realize, all right, this is great, but I wanna supplement this. The way you supplement this is by creating more value on this side of things. 
This might be working harder at your job, getting a raise, getting a promotion, starting another business, starting a side hustle, earning more cash. That way you can put more money here because if you put more money here, your money is going to be able to grow and compound faster. This takes time to grow and it takes more money to grow. The thing that everybody gets wrong about passive income is to sell this idea of you do X, Y, Z and all of a sudden you'll be able to earn five grand a month because you follow the simple passive income formula. But you have to remember, what is passive income? Is passive income you working every single day to earn some cash? No, I don't see the passive in that. Passive income is where you have an asset that is paying you and you're just spending your time on the overall management, not the day-to-day -day management. So if you really want to start generating the passive income, you got to have patience. You need to have more money. The more money you invest, the more cash flow that you can get. And you want to make sure you're spending your time in this passive income doing the higher level management, not the day-to-day -day management. If you really want to become wealthy and have millions of dollars to your name when you're young, then there's really one concept that you have to understand. Now, most of the time when we talk about investing your money in your 20s to become wealthy in your 30s or 40s, the thing that we're talking about is investing your money for the long term, having time on your side, compounding your profits. But that's not what I want to talk about in this video. No, these things are important. Having time for your money to grow and letting your money compound is one of the most powerful tools to let your money grow and compound to build wealth passively. But if you want to build wealth sooner and not just wait for your money to compound and grow, there's something different that you have to understand. When I was in college, I understood that eventually I wasn't going to be in college anymore. And when I wasn't in college, I was going to hit this real world thing where now I would have pressure on me to make money. Because when you're in college, you don't really have the same pressure of making money and supporting yourself and a family because you're in college. But once you're done with college, now all eyes are on you. You got to get a job, you got to start paying your bills and you have to be able to support yourself financially. And so I started to understand that buffer back when I was in college. And that's when I started to ask myself a couple questions. What do I want to do in my life? What do I want to achieve? And what am I willing to risk to make that happen? When I was in college, I started a few businesses and that's when I learned that I don't have it in me to work for somebody else. Some people do, but it wasn't for me. I have this entrepreneur bug where I can't follow somebody else's guidance. I can't follow someone else's directions. I cannot work for somebody else. I had to work for me. Now, I knew that and I was a very hard worker, but I just didn't know how to put the pieces together. How can I now create something where now I'm building a business, where I'm leading the charge, but I don't know what to do. If you're in your 20s right now, you got to understand that you're young and you have time to recover from financial setbacks, which means you have the ability to take risk. I had to start and build a handful of different businesses before I really understood what it took to scale a business. Some of these businesses completely failed. Some of them made me a lot of money, but then it also took me a lot of time to understand how to invest my money, which meant there was times where I lost money. The real upsides that you have in life financially all come with risk. Now, the reason why most people will never be able to achieve the real wealth that they dream of is because they're not willing to take that risk. They always think, oh, what happens if I quit my job? Then how am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to feed my family? How am I going to continue on with my life? If I take this risk and invest my money, what happens if it doesn't work out? If I take this risk, what happens if I fail? How am I going to go back to my husband or my wife? How am I going to tell my kids that I failed? How am I going to live with myself if I take a risk and it doesn't work out for me? But when you're young, one of the biggest advantages that you have on your side is time because you have time to recover from your risk and your failures. And that is one thing that you can never get back. When I was finishing law school about to enter the real world, I knew my cushion was about to go away because I I wasn't going to be in school anymore and now I had to rely on myself to take care of myself because through law school I went to all the classes, I did good in school, but I didn't go out of my way to learn how to be an attorney. I didn't go to all the internships, I didn't go network with all the judges, I didn't go meet all the business owners. I was building my own business and so towards the end of my law school career, that's when it started to hit me. Oh my god. I'm about to graduate and I'm about to be on my own and I'm going to be running my own business and now I'm going to have to be able to support myself and I have no other cushion. This is it. Now I was fortunate where I started businesses years before I even started law school. And so by the time I got to the end of law school, I was already making pretty decent money. My business was doing pretty good. I was making at least six figures a year and I had a few real estate investments. But the issue was now I was losing all the fallback cushion that I had. Now it was all me. But the advantage was now I had more time to work on my business. But it was still stressful. I had a lot of anxiety. I was struggling sleeping at night because I kept thinking, 
What happens if my business doesn't work out? What happens if I screw something up? What happens if I fail? I'm not gonna be able to go back and get a job as an attorney, one, because I'm not gonna know what to do, and second, because I don't wanna do that. So what is my backup? Because when you're taking all these risks and you're starting your own business and you're going for it all, there is no plan B because if you fail, now you got to start all over again. But the thing that I kept telling myself is, hey, if two years go by and you completely fail and nothing is working for you and you have no money, you can still turn things around. You can still go and get a job. You can still go learn and figure out how to become an attorney. Maybe go get a free internship and start working somewhere. I mean, it's going to be harder, but it's still possible. So if things fail, I still have time to fix things. When you're not married and you don't have any kids, you don't got a lot of responsibilities. This is your time to take as many risks as possible. That means starting dumb business ideas because one of these dumb business ideas might actually pan out into a good business idea and that means taking investment risks, investing into things that you think could potentially grow a whole lot bigger in the future. You don't have to play it completely safe when you're young. Yeah, you know, you can have some of your safer investments, you can invest in the ETFs, you can do some of that, but you should also be taking risk because this is your time to take risk. It kills me when I see a young dude out of college, a 20 something, driving around in a nice BMW that they're financing, working a job that they may or may not hate, where they're making an average salary, and then they talk about these big dreams of how they want to become successful and become so rich. But the reality is your actions have to match your goals. Because right now, you are throwing your money away on these liabilities that are not doing anything for you. This is the time that you have to take risks. Get rid of all these liabilities. Get rid of the fancy car, get rid of the brand name stuff for a little while, and invest this money in you. If you have a business idea, go for it. If you want to make an investment, go for it. This is your time to do something. Look, I don't say any of this to brag. I'm saying this to get a point across because you're not gonna get any younger and your responsibilities are only gonna grow as you get older. So this is the time to take risks. The first time I made six figures, I was in school and I was driving around in a beat up car, probably worth $500. The first time my business made a million dollars in a year, I was still in my 20s and I was still driving that beat up car worth $500 because I wanted to invest everything I had back into myself because this was my time to really build, grow, and take risks. It's tough because when you're in your 20s, you want to flex and you want to enjoy your youth, right? You want to go to the club, you want to drive the nice car, you want to go to the parties and you want to go on the nice vacations, show off all your friends, you know, show your cool life off on Instagram. But the reality is you got to figure out what you really want. You got to figure out if your goals are aligning with your actions because a lot of people have goals way up here, but their actions are way down here. They say they want to have all these nice things. They say that they want to become wealthy, but their actions show something completely different. Their actions show them blowing money. Their actions show them just blowing their time. The actions show them not doing anything to actually take them to their goals. Taking that first step is hard because most of us aren't told how to take risks. Most of us aren't told how to manage risks because we're always told that if you make a mistake, it's wrong. Messing up is wrong because you messed up. You screwed up. But the reality is that's how you learn. I screwed up in so many business ideas. I've been scammed. I've been sued. I've been screwed over. But these are the things that got me to where I am today. I mean, the reason why I started Minority Mindset was because because I got scammed and screwed over in another business that I was starting. So I started making videos teaching people how to start a business without getting screwed over. Now this doesn't mean that you shouldn't invest in any of your traditional investments. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't be investing in ETFs. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't be investing in real estate. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't be doing any of that. These are good long-term investments that will help you build wealth over the long term. These are things that you always want to be doing because this is what will build you that long-term consistent wealth. But if you want to get there faster and you want to have more money going into your investments, your passive investments, you need to have more income coming in. And if you really want to have more income coming in, you need to do something that will allow you to have more income, which means you're going to have to take more risk. And the best time to take that risk is now, especially when you're young, because life is just going to get busier. You're going to get more responsibilities. You're going to have more financial commitments and it's going to get harder for you to do that. Doesn't mean it's impossible, but it will never get easier which means if you want to do something, this is the best time to do it. Take that risk today. The best decision I ever made was not listening to anybody else's advice because everybody told me I was dumb. Everybody told me that I should have become a doctor and when I didn't become a doctor that I was dumb. Then when I went to law school, everybody told me that I should have focused harder in my classes. Everyone told me I should have got good internships. Everyone told me that I should have gone and worked for a good attorney after I graduated, but I didn't listen because I wanted something different. I didn't listen to everyone around me and it was hard because everybody kept telling me how dumb I was, but I knew I wanted something different. I wanted something that most people could not understand. I wanted something that the majority of people could not see. 
And that requires you to not go out and take a risk because now you're going against the whole world. Nobody understands what you're doing. Nobody understands why you're doing it. And nobody can see the vision that you have. Nobody can see the dreams and goals that you have. But if you want to achieve these dreams, goals, you want to have that financial success, you got to be willing to go out and do something and most people are not going to understand it. So now you got to be the person to not only go and take the risk, but now you also have to take that criticism from everybody else around you. But that's what's going to help you build that tough skin. That way you can achieve whatever it is that you want. That means you have to be willing to take a risk. If you have a business idea, this is the time to go after it. If you see an investment opportunity and you believe in it, go after it. So what if you lose money? Money will come back, but your time will not. And so you have to be willing to take risks. Now, this doesn't mean do stupid things. Do things that are calculated. Do things that you actually believe in. Do things that have potential for opportunities. And that also means learn. Learn from people that are doing whatever it is that you want to do. You know, back when I was starting my first businesses, YouTube wasn't very popular, especially for people that were entrepreneurs or looking to get financial education. You didn't have this type of stuff on YouTube. So I was reading books. I hated reading when I was growing up. English was my second language. I never read a book until I found a money management book. The first book I ever read was Rich Dad Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. After I read that, I read book after book after book talking about investing your money, money management, building a business, marketing, because these were things that I had never been exposed to before. I went through years of school, but nothing that I went to school for taught me how to actually make money, or how to manage my money, or how to grow my money. These were things I had to learn on my own, not just through books, but by doing it myself. That's why I'm so passionate about the minority mindset because I was doing everything right. I had checked all the boxes. I was busting my butt trying to do everything so I could become successful. But I didn't realize that if I really wanted to become financially successful, there was a different type of education that I needed. If you want to know how to invest your money into ETFs and real estate, that way you have this consistent income coming in when you get older, that's fine. But we have other videos on our YouTube channel talking about that, which is why if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you do that. But what I'm talking about today is if you really want to become wealthy and you want to do it sooner, you need to invest in yourself. And the earlier you do that, the better, because now you have time on your side. You have time to make mistakes, you have time to recover from your mistakes and you have time to go out and actually take action on whatever it is you're doing. Time is going to pass no matter what, whether you do something or whether you don't do anything. Time is going to keep going on. A year from today, you are going to be a year older no matter what. But now the question that you have to ask yourself is where do you want to be a year from now? Do you want to be in the same position you are today or do you want to be somewhere else? If you want to be somewhere else, then you have to take action. It takes time. It's hard. You're not going to know everything and you're going to make mistakes, but that's the only way that you're going to learn. And if you're not willing to take those risks, then you're not going to go anywhere because the more you wait, the more responsibilities that are going to come your way, the less opportunity you're going to have to take those risks and the harder it's going to be for you to break away from the system because now you're going to get trapped in the cycle. You have to go to work. You have to invest in your 401k. You have to pay for your kid's college fund. You have to pay for your spouse's vacation. And as you do that now, you get scared. You get scared of leaving your job. You're scared. What happens if you take that risk and things don't work out? You're scared that, hey, what if it takes me two years before I start making decent money? What if I can't go and get another job? What if the economy fails when I'm starting this business? What if the sky falls or what if you don't get enough sleep to go to work the next day? But if you don't have all those responsibilities around you, it's a lot easier for you to go out and take those risks, which is why if you're younger, it's a lot easier for you to go out and do it. Now, if you're older, that doesn't mean it's impossible. It's going to mean it's a little bit harder, but it is possible if you're willing to put in the work. Remember, you got to have what your goals are and you need to make sure that your actions are aligning with your goals. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, here's a video of things you need to be aware of before you buy a home that I think you'll love and while I add it, I want a free guide on how to start generating passive income. And as always, keep hustling. I had no idea that a pandemic was going to come out of nowhere and decimate our stock market and destroy our economy. If I had known that, I would have shorted the stock market.